Hey, wow, you guys look great. No, seriously, this is like amazing. How often do you guys get a chance to look at this? Like stand up and see your entire school in front of you? I guess when you graduate. So I'm getting to see it now. It's pretty amazing. Um, I'm not a stranger to Andover. I went to the University of Chicago High School. Um, so we knew about Andover. <laughs> Friendly rivalry. Um, I, um, I probably would have erred on the side of I wasn't good enough to get in, so I wouldn't have applied. Actually, it's not funny. It's kind of the truth is, is that often that's part of what we live with. You know, it's just like, me? I could never get in there. They're so smart. Um, and sometimes we end up closing the doors on ourselves, right? Without even, it's like, no, no, no. So um, the person who actually made me believe that maybe I could one day be a full-fledged American actually looked nothing like me, and that was Martin Luther King Jr., um, who I saw as a young person in Chicago. So I've been struggling with this speech. I give a lot of speeches. But when I have to speak to high schoolers, it's like really important that I get it right because I'm a parent of two high schoolers. So I have one speech and then this morning I wrote another speech so I'm really confused about what to do because I want to more than anything um, leave you with something that, that stays with you, that transforms, like the media that I produce, that it, it stays with you and transforms the way you see something about your life today. So I'm going to actually start with a story of somebody who I met just last week. How many of you watched the SAG Awards? Don't be shy. Raise your hands. Hi. Oh, God. You guys are all raising your hands like this. <laughs> OK. So the Screen Actors Guild Award um, gave the Lifetime Achievement Award to Rita Moreno. If you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. She's 82 years old. She was the star of West Side Story. Um, and she got up there and she was, she was given the Lifetime Achievement Award. I was with Rita Moreno at our studios in Harlem earlier last week. And when I asked her about this, she, so she's one of the 11 people in the world who is an EGOT, Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. So she was the third person to get that. Um, and she's got all these achievement awards. And so when I asked her for this interview for Latino USA, I said, so what? You know, what is that like when you get that call of your lifetime achievement? And she was like, I, be, I go back to when I was five years old and coming over on the boat from Puerto Rico. What? You're Rita Moreno. She's like, yeah, but I don't, I don't live in that space. I immediately live in the space full of self-doubt and can I do this? And am I good enough? And so even the most amazing person now speaking live in, you know, to an audience of millions, has that doubt. But that wasn't the story I was going to start with, actually. I was going to start with a story of what it looks like to see an American dream go up in smoke. Because the generation that you are living in right now, mis queridos, your generation is particularly channeled, challenged. You do have a historic duty. There are, it's not like the moment of the civil rights battles are behind us. They are with us today. And in my speech, I hope to paint a picture for you of what we're all living with today, not far from where we are, right here. But my story of someone who I know whose American dream went up in smoke is the story of Silvia. Celia is undocumented. She's Mexican. She lives in Spanish Harlem. She's been here for 25 years. She has three American citizen kids, but she and her husband, of course, walk in fear, even in New York City in Spanish Harlem, a constant fear. Her daughter went to one of the high-performing public schools in New York, public high schools in New York City, was a ballet dancer and had everything going for her and then had sex one night without protection and got pregnant. And she wanted an abortion, but she felt very conflicted because the only time that she had ever been taken out on a political protest was when the nuns took her to Washington for a pro-life rally. That was her experience with democracy. She didn't have the abortion. She had the baby. She dropped out of high school. 
and her mother, Silvia, had these big dreams for her daughter. And when the daughter talks a little bit about why she kind of, she hearkens back to what her mom and dad are living with. She's like, kind of, you know, this country, I don't know, my parents may be deported tomorrow. What's my future here? Why should I care? Why should I care? Her son failed one class in high school, senior year, and so was basically told, don't apply, you'll never make it. And so now he's enrolled um, to, become, to study to become an, a police officer in New York, which is a fine thing, except that Celia doesn't understand why it is that her son would choose to become a member of the NYPD when she spent her whole life being afraid of the NYPD. Because any interaction with the police now when you're undocumented means that you could be handed over to immigration and then you're deported. Silvia's younger daughter, um, coming out of eighth grade last year, was obese. Didn't want to get out of bed. And when I heard this from Silvia, I said, well, I, you know, I have, to, I have to do something. I have to do something. And so... I talked to Lupita and I told her that I would pay for her to en enroll her in boot camp classes and that um, I would get her counsel with a nutritionist and that we wanted to tell her story on radio because that's what I do. I tell stories on radio of, of lives in America today, the lives that you are living with among you. And so for her, her life transformed itself over the summer when she suddenly took control of her life, lost a bit of the fear, and moved forward and started losing weight and started believing in herself and then got out of bed and started going to high school. And she's the hope of the family. My question to you is, is this the America that you want? Is this the America that you want? Because the American dream that Sylvia had holding up in smoke, or holding up in this cloud, went up in smoke when she walked into me and she said, I'm leaving. Me voy. Me canse. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of the promises from the politicians. I'm tired of waiting. I said, Sylvia, if you go home to see your sick mother, you know your chances now of becoming legal in this country disappear. She said, me canse. I'm tired. I'm done with hope for this country. And that, mis queridos, was like a wooden stake going through my heart. When you hear someone say, I basically just gave up hope for this country, how is that possible in this modern age? And it is happening everywhere around you. It is not far from you. Is this the America that you want? The question really comes back to you. I posit that we are, in fact, we, all of us, you, your generation is actually the front lines of the next civil rights movement. We have turned an extraordinary corner in our country around gay marriage. An extraordinary corner. Who would have thought? We're going backwards on certain things. Women's access to reproductive choice, that conversation, we're going backwards. But on gay marriage, we have moved forward. But the civil rights moment the human rights issue of our time is in fact immigration. In fact, it is immigration. And the fact that you have to understand that when Martin Luther King was organizing, those young people who were sitting at those counters, they were invisible for a long time from the mainstream media. They were holding their protests and no one was telling their stories. Right now, how many of you Raise your hands and raise them high. How many of you know what, what the dreamers are, who the dreamers are? Raise your hands up real high. Okay. So that's, I asked that same question of adults, of about this many adults on Martha's Vineyard this summer. Very smart group of adults. Six of them raised their hands. So there are more of you here who know who dreamers are, but it gives me an opportunity to speak about the dreamers and the reasons why you don't know about the dreamers. Those kids who were sitting at those counters, again, they were invisible. Who was telling their stories? 
if they weren't being told on the mainstream media. Right now, dreamers are young people who are brought here as children. They are American in every sense of the word, but they don't have citizenship papers. And so they're stuck. They can't go to school. They can't get a job. They don't have papers. They are the center of the conversation around immigration reform or lack thereof. So if a slice of you knows who the dreamers are, then maybe a smaller slice knows that right now these are the young people who are creating the civil rights movement of your time. And it's your responsibility to go and find out who they are. What are they doing? What do they stand for? Those things that we end up seeing in movies that become like the Freedom Riders, um, those wonderful um, movies around civil rights, The Butler, all of those things that we're seeing, you're actually living in it right now if you open a life that is open to seeing it and grasping it. You know, the joy of what you do here at Andover, the fact that you start your day with jazz. Oh my God, you know, I'm a jazz aficionado. So this was like the highlight. This is the art of life. But you are also challenged with the humanity of life in America today. It is not easy. But you, mis queridos, are in fact the embodiment of the next generation. And so what you decide to know and find out about the dreamers will determine how the dreamers are understood in our country. Like those kids who sat at that counter, who stood in those protests and got smashed with, with the fire hoses and the dogs. So nine dreamers this summer, some of you know about the Dream Nine. Okay, nine dreamers this summer went, these are young people without papers, they got themselves intentionally detained by immigration agents on the border. They were put into detention centers. Right now, if you are a criminal and you end up serving time in the Bureau of Prisons, you actually have more rights than if you are an immigrant put into an immigrant detention center. Immigrants right now, mis queridos, are the canaries in the mine for the limits of what we can do to a people who are perceived to be other or less than. So yes, the documentary that I did, Frontline, Lost in Detention, it uncovered the fact that right now people are being held in solitary confinement for days, for doing nothing, for being, having no charge except for not having papers. And they are being held in solitary confinement in our country at this moment, today, right now not far from here. These Dream Nine, they went down and they intentionally got detained to be put into those detention centers. And then when they went into these detention centers, because we believe in freedom of speech, or do we not in this country? So once they were in, these young dreamers started talking about and talking to other detainees about issues, and they were put into solitary confinement. Young people, like you, whose only crime is being here without papers, put into solitary confinement. What do we think about that? What do you think about that? Maybe to some of you it feels like it's a very distant issue. I understand. But part of what this day is about, it is about, in fact, being able to see yourself in the person most unlike you. In fact, being able to see yourself in the person most unlike you. We are expert in this country in not telling our stories, in not owning our true narrative. So we are expert in making people invisible. There are many invisible people in our country, and I'm challenging you to make them visible. That is what my career has been dedicated to. I grew up feeling invisible. I mean, yes, I went to a privileged, privileged high school, but essentially, my story wasn't told. So I never thought that I should become a journalist because there was no journalist who looked like me who was telling these stories. So we walk around with the invisible next to us. And so I challenge you. There are people who serve you. There are people who serve you every day. They live in your neighborhood. They are here. They are the sons and daughters of undocumented immigrants or immigrants who were once undocumented. And by the way, I would ask you, 
as a campus to consider the conversation around banning the use of the term illegal, illegal immigrant. Now, I didn't learn that from a Latino studies professor when I was in college, a radical professor. No, I actually learned that from somebody who won the Nobel Peace Prize, Elie Wiesel. When I said to him, Elie, he survived the Holocaust. Um, and I said to him, Elie, what should I do when I'm a correspondent at CNN and they're asking me to use this term illegal immigrant? And he said, there's no such thing as an illegal human being. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, somebody may have committed a crime, but that doesn't make that person an illegal person. That's like, you know, you're driving and you're caught speeding. So you're not an illegal driver from there on in. You, know, you don't pay your taxes one year or whatever. You're not an illegal taxpayer. You're not an illegal immigrant. You came to this country without papers. You did commit an illegal act, but you yourself are not an illegal human being. And Elie Wiesel said, you know what happened? The Nazis declared the Jews an illegal people. So what do you think about the fact that in this moment in history, when everyone is looking towards your generation, I know that you don't necessarily feel that, right? Because your life is about, you know, the bubble, the school, the pressure. I get that. But outside in the world, this is a conversation. And people being dehumanized right here, right now, how do you feel about that? What are you going to do about that? That's really the challenge. So this notion of seeing yourself in the person most unlike you and understanding what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe not in a place like Andover. When I was introduced, I, um, you talked about some of the reporting that I did in Alabama, which feels very far away, but Alabama is a part of this country. So what goes on in Alabama, in fact, does impact us. What goes on in North Dakota, in fact, impacts us. In Alabama, we had a piece on Latino USA this week. In Alabama, if you are caught with a broken taillight and the police encounter you, they must hand you over to immigration agents. What do you think about that? In Georgia, if you're undocumented and you want to go to, to college, a state college, it's illegal. It's illegal for you to go to college. Is this the America that we want to live in now? So what have we given, what has this given birth to? It's also given birth to a core of who you are, these core values of questioning democracy, of engagement. And so in Arizona, when they ban books, banning books in the year 2014, are you kidding? They ban books, the Tucson Unified School District for ethnic studies classes, books aimed um, at Latino, for Latino writers. Sandra Cisneros, her books banned. So what happened? Well, someone created the Libro Traficante movement. Not Narco Traficante movement, Libro Traficante movement, the book smuggler movement, to smuggle books into Arizona? What? Yeah, it's silly, that's, that's like insane. So now you know these classes are banned in Georgia. I'm sorry for um, undocumented college students. We have underground college classrooms right now. Do you understand what I'm telling you? That there was a moment in time when the whole civil rights conversation was happening outside of the mainstream and it was alive. Martin Luther King wasn't, you know, wasn't the star. That was part of a movement. And there is a movement now that is happening right now in your lifetimes if you open your eyes and research, see yourself in the person most unlike you, these undocumented immigrants in places like Georgia. That is happening today. So the notion about undocumented immigrants being canaries in the mine, what does that mean? Okay, so 
tonight, there will be people preparing, immigration agents preparing across the country to go and round up immigrants tomorrow morning. And there will be a knock at the door, and there will be a knock at 6 a.m. And what will happen is that you'll come down, you're kind of blurry-eyed, you don't know what's going on, and you see these people standing at the door with big um, uh, baseball caps and uniforms that say police everywhere. In fact, they're not the police, they're immigration agents. It is illegal to impersonate a law enforcement officer, and yet that is happening every single day, today, mis queridos, in your time, in your America, what do you think about that? What will you do with that information? That is due process, our due process that is being challenged at every moment. So the humanity side of it, the humanity side. So I'm giving you all of these, you know, and, and to be honest with you, my kids are like, mom, you're such a downer. You know, could you stop? Like, really stop, but you're such a downer. And it's a problem because you know, all of those accolades, the four Emmys, the John Chancellor Award, the Edward R. Murrow Award, yeah, that comes because you choose to go into something that is really difficult and painful. And I put myself there at great cost. I mean, not really, right? I mean, we're bien, nosotros estamos bien, we are fine. We will make it through the greatest of challenges that you face on this campus and in your lives. We will make it, you will make it. You are, you are the creme de la creme. You are, you will succeed. But the question is, and everyone else, and everyone else, this is the world's greatest democracy where less than 50% of our people vote. That is determined by you. So the challenge comes down to what you will do and how you will do it. There are things that are happening. Again, immigration. How many of you, raise your hands if you know, and you're aware of the conversation around private prisons? OK. So you know, most people have no idea that there are people who are making profits off of keeping a body in a cell. That there are people who make a profit off of keeping a body in a cell in our country. How is that possible? I'm going back to the hopeful speech now. Sorry. I like to live my life sometimes like I've, I'm in a Fellini movie because um, <clears throat> sometimes it's just the best way to kind of deal with the surreality that we, conf that we confront. And so the encounters that we have in our lives can also be, you know, when I'm asking you to see yourself and the person most unlike you and to see, to make the invisible visible, those moments can change your life. They're the, life, they're the moments that we live for, frankly. So last week, my daughter, who's at a high-performing private school in New York City, someplace on a hill called Riverdale, um, had a rough week. Bad math exams, and unfortunately, like so many of our teenagers, immediately took it inward. I wasn't good enough, I'm not good enough, um, I'm just not good enough, which is a challenge I'm very worried about for your generation, that I'm not good enough. Um, and so she had, uh, she had a, a conversation with a taxi driver that was extraordinary. My kids always make fun of me because they say that, you know, I'm the worst person to get into a cab because within five minutes I'll be interviewing the cab driver and I'll find out their entire life story. So she makes fun of me and then, you know, then she reveals that on the cab drive home from her babysitting job, she asked the cab driver if she could have a conversation with him. She tapes the conversation. But the first question she asks him is this, Mr. Cab Driver, what do you do when someone disappoints you? What do you do when someone disappoints you? And the cab driver turned out to be this amazing philosopher who, yes, because if you are open, 
and you approach it not from a place of power but of humility, yes, you can learn from the person most unlike you. Most unlike you. And so if you live your life like you're in this movie all the time, it leads to amazing moments of engagement. Now, for Latinos in particular, we're living another particular reality that is part of your dynamic as well. Latinos are the fastest growing demographic group in the country. How many of you knew that? Raise your hands if you knew that Latinos. Wow, amazing, amazing. Good, so then you know now that in a decade, Andover will have to look very different. It will. I don't mean that in a bad way. What I'm trying to tell you is that that is a reality that you are living with right now. The Latino demographic explosion. Educating Latinos is gonna be central to how the rest of us all move in the world. Every 90 seconds, a Latino turns 18 in our country. Every 90 seconds. And so what Latinos think and talk about in terms of, of education, in terms of democracy, in terms of engagement, it's going to affect all of us. The problem is that right now with Latinos, we're living a US mambo. Three steps forward, two steps back. So for example, you know, Sofia Vergara can be the highest paid television actress in the country. Amazing. Extraordinary actress. But Latina teenagers have the highest rate of attempted suicide in our country. How many of you knew that Latina teenagers have the highest rate of attempted suicide in our country? It is a story of our time. The other new S. Mambo, Latinos are a trillion dollar market, and yet more of us are being detained and deported than ever before. That the percentage of Latinos who took the ACT last year grew by 90% and yet we have one of the highest growing, fastest growing dropout rates. We're living this US mambo. The message is communicated to Latinos is very complicated. And so the conversation about who we are now, Latinos, is also a core part of the conversation of the next part of the civil rights movement. We're confused. We're confused about our, about our identity. The big joke, of course, is that among Latinos, you know, none of us ever feels Latino enough. You know, I don't speak Spanish, I'm not Latino enough. I, didn't go, I haven't gone back to Latin America, I'm not Latino enough. And we then internalize this and self-critique ourselves. And in the midst of that, we lose our sense of power and confidence. To have Latinos succeeding in our country in the United States of America right now is good for all of us. And so I do place a challenge to all of you in your lives because Latinos are around you in every place that you engage. And yet many Latinos are walking around feeling in this country like we're not good enough. It's crazy, the fastest growing demographic group and yet we're filled with self-doubt. That is not good for our democracy, mis queridos. Columbia University, my alma mater, the Latino student group had a, a, a celebration for Hispanic Heritage Month, which I celebrate every month. And um, their title of their, of their panel was Dejando la duda atrás, acknowledging the power of our voices. Leaving the doubt behind, acknowledging the power of our voices. It can't be that at a time when we need you strong, all of you in all of your amazing diversity, and we need Latinos strong, that we are filled with self-doubt. We cannot live in that place of questioning ourselves and never feeling good enough. Each one of us, every single one of us, has to take the challenge of what we do the best and do it. 
And you're finding that now. I asked you to, last night when we had dinner, I asked each of the students what was their dream o vision for what they want to do, the thing that they most dream, that might seem most inaccessible, to say it out loud. We need your dream o vision. We need your action. We need you to not be afraid. We need you to understand that you have this moment in history and you are making it. You're in that Fellini movie. You're in it and you're making history at every moment. I saw myself invisible. I created media to make it visible. And in a minute, we're going to watch this so you can see what we're trying to do, not only on radio, but on television. What do you do? If I tell stories, will you find the cure for Alzheimer's? I hope so. Quickly. Very quickly. So, if you take it back into your own lives, what is the thing that you can do? Telling stories is what I do. Telling stories of the most invisible people is what I do. Makes my kids very sad, but it's what I do. So we're going to watch six minutes of, where would it be? Someone will come and turn this on, I hope. Someone who knows. Who's always there? Um, the use of graphics is really important to us in media. I'm trying to change the narrative. I see myself as a disruptor. A lot of people don't want to see these stories, but the reason why the series is called America by the Numbers is because we want to approach stories that by the numbers are irrefutable. And we're dedicated to telling stories of the untold and unseen America. The numbers make it irrefutable. We're living the largest demographic change in history. Today, already, one in three Americans are multicultural. When you look at the population under 18, it's already closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. By 2042, demographers project that we'll be a multicultural majority nation. Should white America be afraid of becoming a minority? This new multicultural America is not what's next, it's now. That's Annie Banning's name. It got the day she was born and the day she passed. Oh my goodness. All these pictures is her. All of them? Uh -huh. This one's her? Uh-huh. Oh my God, she's so cute. She was only three months in that picture. That's like a week or so before she passed. And she looks so healthy. She was a healthy baby. They told me there was nothing wrong with her. She just passed away in her sleep. Rochester has some of the highest infant mortality rates in the US. If you're not rich and you're African-American or Latino, you'd be better off being born in Libya than in Rochester if you want to make it to your first birthday. Jeff has uh, all those little things. This is his picture. Oh my goodness. He was really tiny. Mm -hmm. So he weighed uh, 730 ounces when he was born. It took the breathing tube out to let me hold him. And he's just staring me in my eyes. And he's just, I can't do anything. Just hold him and look at him. That's like one of the hardest parts to go back to. He was just an angel that was called back. Every year we lose between 60 and 70 babies in the city of Rochester. It's because of this environment. In my neighborhood where I live at, it's just it's horrible. There's no jobs here. There's no like community centers. Domestic violence, it's horrible here in Rochester. I'm not even gonna sit here and lie to you. It, it really is, it's sad. 
My name's Yolanda. My name and number's on the bottom. I call myself a foot soldier. I am out in the community walking the streets in targeted neighborhoods where I know that there's a high infant mortality rate, talking to anyone that will talk to me, to let them know about different programs that the city of Rochester offers to try to help reduce infant mortality so that mom can have the best, healthiest pregnancy that she can have. We may never be able to save all babies, but we could do so much better. We could cut infant mortality rates into the United States down to where they are in other developed countries from where we are 51st in the world down to first or second and why wouldn't we want to do that? Guam is one of the most militarized places in the world. I wonder how people in the United States would feel if let's say 28% of California was military bases. We have in studio tonight a very special guest, the Honorable Eddie Bazacabo. Thank you, sir, for coming aboard. Again, it's a pleasure and honor to be here, to be in the Vets Talk Show Radio. I don't think people realize how much Guam's community really revolves around the service to the country, the family members that have served. The... We have 600 that are now deployed in Afghanistan, the largest a deployment in the history of the National Guard. The men and women of Guam are U.S. citizens and enlist in the American military at a rate that's three times higher than the rest of the country. And in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Pacific Islanders have the highest rate per capita of casualties and deaths, the ultimate sacrifice. But what happens when these veterans do come home? This is where the IED went off. The kids were standing right around here, waving at us as we were driving by. But we didn't expect them to try and blow us up. Sometimes it's almost real again. When I'm driving, just driving, those, those fleeting thoughts of, I can just let the steering wheel go. Or why don't I just run my truck into the wall? It crosses your mind. Yeah. Oh, quite often, yes. Every day, once a week? <sighs> at least two or three times a day. Here at the Vet Center we have three staff members. Uh, we could use another three. I could use uh, resources to open another drop-in center. I could use resources to hire peer counselors. A lot of the programs uh, that are available, like in Hawaii, are not necessarily available here. The United States has an obligation to ensure that the proper resources are given to our people. Uh, these American citizens of Guam really have not felt what true democracy is all about. Oil. Just give me an idea how much money we're looking at. Ten times 400 is what? 4,000? Times 100 bucks. It's 40,000. It's $40,000. Yeah. Every week. Yeah. What does that do to suddenly, you know, you've on the, you're on this land, you never had that kind of money, and all of a sudden it's like, boom, money, big money. You learn as you go, and if you don't, it'll It'll, it'll run right over you. Since the oil boom, one of the biggest problems has been what's happened to the roads. There are 2,500 trucks on these roads every single day, seven days a week. And once a week, someone dies on these roads in a traffic accident. It was like one of the worst fatalities on our reservation. The semi-driver, he just went to the hospital with minor injuries. Was he charged? Did you want him to be charged? Yeah, because he took four lives with, and he walked away with a scrap. It's been two years and I still, it still feels like yesterday. <laughs> Has it always been known as a place to get meth? Fort Berthold was never one of the places that was on the map. 
until the oil moved in and the man camps went up and the drug cartels came um, and now it's everywhere. So there's an oil boom? That, yeah. well, how does that equate to meth? Well, because now people have money to buy it. When you think about the oil on this reservation, is it a blessing or is it a curse? To me, personally, it's, it's a curse. I wish it would go away. I wish it never came here. So we choose to tell those stories. That's why I had to form my own company because sometimes those stories are, you know, the fact that Rochester, New York has the highest infant mortality rate among black and Latina women might not necessarily rise to the top. That was my path. What is yours as leaders? I leave you with one final story because I also want you to get out of your comfort zones and I also want you to learn how to speak up and I also want you to learn how to recognize and to challenge within your own community. My daughter, your age, she's heard Mexican jokes at her school. She's Mexican. And this is a progressive school. So see it, talk about it, challenge it. Get out of your comfort zone. It's hard, I know. But here's a story of the ultimate getting out of your comfort zone. So after 9-11, I get a phone call. I'm at CNN. I'm at my desk, and the phone rings. And on the other side of the phone, there's this guy who's got this accent. He's like, hello? Is Maria Heine Josa there? And I'm like, yeah, Ina Hosa. Hi, Ms. Heine Josa. My name is A.J. Dinkins, and I'm originally from uh, 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 South Carolina, but I now live in Augusta, Maine. And myself and my partner, Rudy, the farmer, we have just raised several thousand dollars for Miss Julia Hernandez, a woman, who, a woman who I reported on who had lost her husband uh, on 9-11, and I put her story out on CNN. AJ had seen it, and he called, and he wanted to come and give gifts to Julia. So the call was strange. He was this gay hairdresser from Augusta, Maine, who wanted to bring gifts to an undocumented Mexican immigrant woman who lives in the Bronx in New York. And AJ was like, Miss Maria, uh, I want to come down to New York City to give these gifts to Miss Julia Hernandez and her children. But I have never been to New York and I have never been to the Bronx. So Miss Maria, I was wondering if you would come and get me and take me to Miss Julia Hernandez's house to deliver these gifts. It was Christmas time by the time he had seen the piece. AJ was a hairdresser, so he had dyed his hair red. Um, and so I said to AJ, AJ, I will come and pick you up at the airport, but um, I'm going to be coming with a camera crew because I'm going to do the story for CNN of the day the gay hairdresser from Maine came down to deliver these gifts to this 9-11 family in the Bronx. And so I go pick up AJ. Again, I spotted him because of the red hair. Um, and I took him up to the Bronx. He had never been to New York. He had never been to the Bronx. He had never met any Mexican people because they were not up in Augusta, Maine in 2001. They're there now, but they weren't there then. Um, and so he had never met any, any Mexicans. And Julia had never met a white gay man that she didn't work for. So I, I didn't know what to expect. It was a love fest. They got out of their comfort zone. They saw themselves in the person most unlike them. They got out of their space and they're like, you know, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Can I do this? Am I? And just did. And AJ left that day and he said, oh my God, I love this family so much. I want to invite them up to my home in, in Maine, to my farm. And I thought, well, you know, maybe that'll happen. But six months later, the phone rings and it's AJ. And he's like, hey, Maria, listen, I want you to pack up your husband and your kids and come on up to Augusta, Maine, because I have invited Julia Hernandez, her four kids, plus the cousin, to come up and spend a week at my farm in Maine. Will you come, Miss Maria? And I said, AJ, I'm not bringing my husband or my kids, but I'll be there with a the camera crew to do the story of the day. <laughs> that the gay hairdresser from Maine and his partner, Rudy the Farmer, invited a family of undocumented immigrants to their home. And we were in Augusta, Maine in 2001. Again, it was kind of homogeneous then. I haven't been back since, but I think it's probably less homogeneous. But we, we kind of stood out. I mean, it was me, 
my uh, cameraman, the hippie with the ponytail, my African-American sound uh, technician, uh, AJ with blonde hair, Rudy the farmer in overall, six foot four, Julia, the four kids plus the cousin in Augusta, Maine. And people were just like, who are these people? Like, who are they and why are they here? And we come back to some of the opening statements about community of love, community of good, community of being able to see yourself in the person most unlike you. Because all we were there to do, all we were there to do were to make those children feel loved a little bit more on the upcoming coming anniversary of their dad's death on September 11th. But the fact that people who didn't look like them welcomed them into their homes and said, I am you, you are me, and I feel your heart, can be perhaps the greatest civil rights lesson that Martin Luther King taught us and that I leave you with today. And so yes, to echo on those comments, be prepared today to get out of your comfort zone, to see the invisible, to question yourself and your role, to have dialogue with someone most unexpected, to have your moment in the Fellini movie, movie, to understand that what you do has an impact in this moment in history for your life and for all of us. We need you. We need you strong and thinking and critical. We need you. So go and perform. Muchas gracias. Thank you. What an honor. Um, I think we have time for two questions. So, um, so sit down. Thank you very much. That is like... Um, Do we have wow. anyone ready? Uh, we have time for two questions and the first two to the mic. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Hello. My name is Alex Anderlick. I'm Hello, from Missoula, Alex. Montana. And uh, my question is, uh, you are sort of the, like, you're the, the driving force behind this nonprofit media organization. Yeah. And I was wondering, how do you get, like, the resources and the funding to be able to keep this going? And also, how do you get people who, I guess, they wouldn't want to, like, they don't really want to see these stories? How do you get people to really open their eyes and, like, listen and change their minds? Well, that's why I do, I work in public media, because public media actually has much better numbers than cable, because it's actually everywhere. Um, and so in places where you least expect it, it is there. Um, I love your question. Um, if it was up to me, um, I would have probably um, stayed just being a working journalist because that's what I love. I had to create my own company. Um, and so I spend a lot of time doing stuff now that isn't the journalism part of it. So it's a challenge. But I see that, again, as my historic duty and responsibility so I kind of have to eat the spinach, which I love. But I have to eat the spinach to get the good stuff. Um, we are getting ready to shoot the next. Um, our series will run on PBS, America by the Numbers. You can follow me or Futuro or Latino USA on Twitter, and you'll know we're going to be on the air in 2014. Um, yes, we don't have a corporate sponsor, in part probably because we're pointing to these issues of injustice and kind of like, who wants to see that, right? So that's why we do what we do. Um, but I believe that there are people who also want to support this, so I raise funds from philanthropists and from foundations, and we're trying to figure out how to way, a way to make money with what we do. But that's hard because really I feel that my core, that my role is to be an American journalist and to shed light and to tell the stories, the untold stories. But there was a headline that I forgot to tell you guys, and I'm so glad you're here. Are you studying journalism? Uh, well, I did last term, and I'm doing media studies right now. Great, okay. So we have a great internship program in the heart of Harlem at the Futuro Media Group. So if you want to apply, just let us know. You just have to have a place to stay in New York City. But we feel very strongly about educating the next generation of journalists. So. You see me, I see you, maybe you'll do an internship. Or if you know anyone who would like to. Great question, thank you so much. Thank you.
Is there a second question? No. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, we do have a question. All right, Carrie. All right, Carrie. First, I'd like to say thank you for being here. Um, I really liked your speech, and it's been really inspiring. So when you speak to undocumented um, females or males, any, anyone, how does that relate to them and protection? Really because good question. Correct. if you're filming or talking to someone, then the government knows they're there. So how can you protect them? You know, it's really strange because the government knows they're there in, in all kinds of strange ways. Most recently, I just found out because my son turned 18 that he has to register for selective service. And so I read everything about selective service. And it says on the paperwork for selective service, even if you are in the country without papers, you have to sign up for selective service. <laughs> what? Um, so, it is um, very difficult for us. Um, we talk long and hard with all of the people who we speak with. Um, in radio, it's not an issue because we don't show the faces. Um, and that's one of the joys of radio. So, you know, and radio is exploding, um, audio, storytelling, and reporting. Um, in terms of television, it is a much greater challenge. And something that I never thought I would see was actually was when the government did in fact target someone who I did put on television. And it was very distressing. In terms of immigrants, as I said, if you are a prisoner in a jail, you have more protection legally, how much you're fed, what you're given, you know, your rights, your phone call, all of those, than if you are an immigrant in detention. Um, so it is very difficult to tell these stories. Um, there are also people who feel that they, it's kind of their, their political duty to be, um, as they say, undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic, and so they want to speak. But it is, a, it is a tremendous challenge and a really great question. Are you studying journalism? No. Wow. Then those were two questions from students who are not focusing on journalism. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys are really wonderful. Um, I look forward to, to seeing some of you in the training. I just want to tell you how much hope I have, how much hope I have for all of you. You, you have no clue how beautiful of a scene this is, and it fills me with hope. Muchas gracias. Muchas, muchas gracias.